If you're 32 and you hate your career, uh, you can go back and get a graduate degree and switch careers and retire in a different career, which is, by the way, what my dad did. My dad didn't go to mm -hmm. seminary for those years. You know, years. I'm not switching, right? So, you know, <laughs> at 51, you tend to be a little bit more in a certain direction. Uh, but in that 30, 34 round range, there's, there's, there can be transition. So I, I had that in my mind. And then I started really thinking about what is it that I can tell these kids that they're not being told. Easy, pass me, it's all good. Yeah. Hello, it's Amy again, and I'm back with another episode of the Performance Mindset Podcast. After a decade of helping business owners and investors to achieve their goals, I've decided to connect with some of the most impactful leaders and individuals I've met along the way. Today, I have with me John Crossman, who I met early on in my commercial real estate career. Had, he's been a real estate executive, speaker, author, and uh, what he's most known for is his organizational uh, go-to market strategies. He now provides consulting services and still does commercial real estate as well. And he has a passion for helping young professionals. And that's one of the reasons why we connected. I'm technically a millennial myself. And he wrote a recent book called Career Killers, Career Builders, and it's the book that every millennial should read. He shares some of the keys to his professional and personal success, including the importance of being coachable. And I thought that tied in so well with the, the podcast that I have here today, The Performance Mindset. So welcome, John. Hello, how are you doing? Excellent. It's a great day. Absolutely. So let's start from the beginning. Um, how did you get into commercial real estate? Well, you know, I came from a, a, a working class kind of environment. And um, you know, my dad was a pastor and civil rights leader. And so we had a household that really believed in being involved in the community and uh, really believed in education. Uh, but, you know, we had limited resources um, just growing up and being in an environment like that. So I always tell people I became a devout capitalist at a young age. Um, so I knew I wanted to go into a place where I could work really hard. I like work. I like working hard and then be compensated well. And I went to FSU and I took the principles of real estate class there. And they had a guy teach named Dr. John Lewis. Dr. Lewis said in the class, if you are a finance major, which I was at the time, and you switch to real estate, you'll have more fun and make more money doing it. And mm. that sounded very appealing to me. <laughs> and so that was my switch into real estate. And, I, and I'm very blessed because FSU's real estate program is one of the best in the nation. And so they really helped launch me into my career. And you you mentioned your father. For those who are, aren't familiar with his, his legacy, can you share a bit about his, his work? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my parents were uh, very involved early on. In fact, it's funny, as a side note, sorry, drama pen. As a side note, my grandfather was born in the 1800s. You can imagine that, served in World War I and was in Toledo, Ohio. And he had dry cleaning business and he had both black and white customers and black and white employees. And so my dad growing up and working for him in the forties had that exposure back then. And so uh, when my dad and mom got sort of involved, uh, you know, my parents were at Dr. King's funeral uh, in Atlanta uh, when that happened and then continued the work they did in the 60s, 70s and 80s and all the way up to the 90s. And then um, several years ago, uh, the um, uh, at the time, Governor Rick Scott and a bipartisan group of leaders uh, named an actual bridge after my dad, which is in Maitland Winter Park, Eatonville area. If you can if you look up the Reverend Kenneth St. Crossman Bridge. So they named that bridge after him for his bridge building work of getting people to work together. I talked to people commonly, whether it's regarding race relations or anything like that, it's, it's better to build a bridge than, than a wall and right. you know, find a way to connect and even just doing deal work or anything like that yeah. is so important. And I, I have the 
um, I'm able to go um, under that bridge frequently <laughs> being, being in that area. So I, I did want to wow. uh, let our listeners know about him. So in recent years, um, you had retired and then did come back to commercial real estate and started a new company. Did that change mm-hmm. at all your perspective with respect to business? And if so, how? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the reason why I sold uh, uh, Crossman company was uh, my stepfather. My dad died a long time ago. My stepfather was my mom's caregiver and he passed away in the summer of 2019. And so that, you know, there were a series of events there because I had two teenage daughters and then, you know, an elderly mother that needed some help. And then on top of that, my wife um, uh, had a very, very, very serious illness on top of that. So mm-hmm. these four ladies in my life that really needed my help. And so I announced it as a retirement. Some people gave me some grief about that, but I was really ready to walk away and I, and I needed the world to shut down. I needed things to yeah. shut down so I could focus on that. And I went through a whole season of like, kind of kind of what's next. And during that season, um, Al Weiss, who's the former CEO of Disney, is a friend of mine. And he gave me some advice to hire a transitions coach. I never heard of that. Nice. So I hired this company called uh, Lee Heck Harris. And, you know, it took like six months. and They do all these profiles of you and things about your life and kind of helping you, what's the next step? Well, one of the things they came back and said to me is that I'm the type of person that never retires. So they gave me that title, like you're never retired, which was, that's okay, we'll take that. And then they came back and they ranked all these jobs, like careers to, with me based on who I am. And it was a point system. So like as a florist, I got like a 21. And as an architect, I think I got a negative 37, which I don't know why they just wouldn't give me a zero at that point. There's no reason to hurt my feelings you know, on top of that. So when they came back and they had the top careers for me, uh, the in order they were in, in the bottom going up were a uh, counselor um, and then a politician and then real estate executive. And then number one was pastor. And I just decided at that point in my life that um, I'm just going to embrace those things. I'm just going to embrace that and be that guy. So when you're talking about like change perspective, I'm not the person I was before and I've just sort of re, re, redid it. So you know, the work I do now with my company is I'm buying properties. And so I'm an investor owner. And as of today, I now own three properties and running those properties. And then I have uh, three developments that uh, I'm working on. And then I do some consulting work. The consulting work I do is pretty fun, more senior level. And I have a handful of clients that I work with a couple of companies. And then I also have my other company, which is Crossman Career Builders, which is that's really I do my social impact work, which is we have about 11 endowed scholarships at seven universities. And then we do a lot of advocacy work um, on different issues that are important to me, whether they be mental health or race or things like that. And it totally is a financial loser, but that's OK, because that's that's the whole point. We set it up to be something that's helping people. That's that's incredible. Um, one of the coaches that I work with personally says you realize the most success in what you are are focused on. So the that you had the opportunity because of the decisions you made and the discipline you had leading up to that to put the focus on the those four ladies. And um, it, it's it's too bad that those that gave you grief because I think you you were able to 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 make an impact and maybe maybe it wasn't the same as it was before, but I, I think that's that's quite admirable. I appreciate it. It's funny. You learn a lot about humanity, you know, uh, hmm. uh, when I tell people what I did, um, there's a decent amount that never say anything. Like they don't say, oh, well, how's your mom or how's your wife? Or they just go right to the, whatever they want to talk about. And then there's others who I'll see and they'll hug me and they'll be like, how's your family? Right. So hmm. you sort of learn about kind of where people are at with all that. And then also it was very liberating to just be like, yeah, I'm on a job. And people say, what are you doing? Like, I'm employed. And, you know, you also learn like what real relationships you have, you know, people that are really interested. And, you know, it's funny mm. because I kind of grew up in the DEI space. And for years I was talking about it. And I think being, people were probably annoyed with me. And now people want to talk about it, which is, is really cool. And I'm in a place where I have capacity and so I can talk about it and, and hopefully be a resource and help people. 
Yeah, that is interesting. So, you know, when you retired, I think you were probably able to see, you know, which were relationships and what what might have been more transactional for for you guys yeah. to for people to connect and and give and so yeah, it gave you definitely gave you a new perspective and now you're able to kind of design the life more so that you want. So, for sure. Yeah. And so that leads us to, I was actually, we were going to talk a bit, a bit about DEI. And so um, it, it's prevalent now more in conversation, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, for those of us that are in commercial real estate, what, what do you see that we should be doing most to, to advance that? Well, well, I think that, you know, you may have heard me say this before, but we seem to live in a culture that thinks I tweet, therefore I am. Like somehow if I get like the perfect tweet, um, that that's going to help, right? Yeah. And, you know, people are not going to really remember our social media posts. Um, our social media is not currency. Currency is currency. And so mm. what I would tell people is that like, try to figure out um, a way that, that, it, that you have the skill set to impact and then try to think about a very specific actionable item, okay? And that might simply be like, if you're a small company, it's like, Hey, we want to develop a relationship, um, you know, with the Thune Cookman or FAMU, or it could be, you know, if you're Orlando and UCF, but you say I want to work with minority students, maybe work with, you know, um, you know, group of a minority group of students there that you connect to, and really say, you know what, we're going to mentor one student a year. Right? Like, if that's all you have the capacity for, but that's real, then do that. Mm -hmm. um, to take it to a next step, I would say that um, people say they love something until you ask them to write a check, and then it turns out they like it. You know, people are like, <laughs> oh, I bleed orange and blue, you know, or garden gold. And you ask them to write a check. And it's like, oh, well, I like you. I like, I like that, but you don't love it. You know, that's, that's the truth of the matter. So, you know, some people are indifferent. Some people like diversity, inclusion, and some people love it. If you love it and, you know, some companies say, hey, this is a core, they put it on their website. Look, if you put it on your website and you're saying it's a core pillar and your, your budget for it is zero, then that's pretty disingenuous, right? So, then I would say, you know, make a financial investment. But when I say make an investment, make an investment, like look for a return of that investment. And, and, and that doesn't mean to your company, but like that it's actually doing something that's meaningful and that it, it's helpful and, and lean into that in a more meaningful way. And, you know, it's funny, um, Amy, that um, you get some people that, some people don't want racism to end. You know that? Like uh, on, on every side, because some people make money by, uh, you know, saying that racism is over here and some people make money by saying there is no racism. There are people on both, both sides of the extreme that, that kind of kind of keep going. We've got to have more people that get, step into the middle and work together, get groups working together to make, make real impact. And so we, we could use more of that. It's intentional. And then the last thing I say with that is like, look, I would never tell somebody don't recruit at your alma mater, or, you know, wherever you went to school, you recruit your alma mater, of course you should. And I would just say, like, just be inclusive and, and, and also recruit at, at Black colleges. Also, you know, reach out to the Central Florida Urban League when you post a job. Make sure they see it. Reach out to the Black mm. Chamber, the Hispanic Chamber, post a job there too, right? So, you know, diversity is not about lowering the bar. It's about widening the net. What I always tell people is, mm. was the 1968 University of Alabama football team the best representation of the athletes in their state? I guarantee you it was not, Right. Diversity made them a better football team. There was no quota or affirmative action. It was, we just want to get the best athletes on the field and then boom, it's a great team. And so, you know, to me, whether your company's big or small, what you want is you want the best athletes on the field. And, you know, uh, some of those are going to come from different environments. And sometimes people, diversity, they have a better, different perspective, a healthy perspective that can help your company, you know? I was talking to a young employee recently and they were talking about a real estate company that when they toured it, it felt like a fraternity. And in, in the context of it felt like this really set culture that wasn't gonna be welcoming anybody else. And I, I, think, that's, I think that's a dangerous thing. You know, that's, a, that's sort mm -hmm. of an old school mindset. And of course, I don't have a problem with somebody wanting like, oh, a brotherhood or, you know, a team. Like I get that, but you also wanna have a place that's welcoming of different kinds of feedback. Yeah, I, I, I agree that there, there depends. I mean, there's people on, on both different sides. And I think that just at least being flexible to considering, 
you know, looking at these other sources, you, you just don't know until, until you try. Uh, one thing that I felt was important is when you connected me with FAMU and I had a conversation more about DEI is, you know, in, in some years there's been a push to, to bring on minorities within the company, but then like you're talking about, if you don't have the budget or you don't have the tools, um, I think it's important to do, do, you know, do research as well so that there, there is that support and, you know, whether connecting with you or connecting with someone else, like what, what are those things that, that you will need so that, uh, so that you are positioning them for the greatest level of success. If you, you find someone. Right. right. Well, and our business can be hard in the context of like, most of our people are very busy and it's hard to like make time. You got to kind of slow down and try to help out have those resources. But I come back to, it's like, you have to define who you are. Look, if you're somebody that wants to get in great shape, you need to put going to the gym on the calendar and like make it a priority, <laughs> go to the gym, right? You know, otherwise you're not gonna be in great shape. So if you're gonna take it seriously, you've got to do some things that take it seriously. And I'll add, listen, you know, um, uh, with some of the work I do, the people that you would think would be the most helpful many times are not, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. people have a reputation like, Oh, I bet that person really helps you. They don't. And then sometimes you would think, Oh, I bet that kind of person would never help you are the people that help me the most. And so, you know, I think that's just another part of that perspective. Like I happen to be a very kind of personally, you know, politically and socially conservative. And I work with people from a completely broad spectrum. And so, you know, I have people that um, are, are, barely pro Trump, some people are never Trumpers, and everything in between uh, that I'll work with, but they have to have a spirit of wanting to focus on, on, on the issue. I, I tell my kids this, you can focus on principles or you can focus on power, uh, but it's really hard to focus on both. And if you focus on principles, you're like, oh, you know what, we'll let power go away because we're going to do the right thing. If you're totally mm -hmm. locked on power, you know, then sometimes you'll let principles go away, you know. Um, and so it's like, um, like I would say this about President Trump, uh, up until his presidency, I mean, at, during his presidency, he provided the largest support for historically black colleges in U.S. history. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a good thing. Like, look, and somebody might say, oh, I totally get, disagree with Trump, and I don't like him. And I'm like, hey, no problem. This thing was good, though, right? <laughs> He's done more of that. And President Biden has done more of that, right? So I sit in a position where I'm like, thank you, President Biden. Thank you, President Trump. This is something that's important to me. I think it's important to our industry. It's a good thing. So let's find that commonality and then find ways to work together to make something healthy. We can we can take other topics and put them on the shelf. You know, we mm -hmm. don't we don't need to talk about you know per, they have gun control or abortion in our real estate context. But what we do need to talk about is employment and real estate education. And so those are ways we can we can come together regardless of our political beliefs. Mm. I think that's important to say too. I think that so so often it ends up being so red or blue instead of looking at the things that we can bring together and maybe be. Um, there's a guy uh, Gary V that talks a bit about being a bit more like purple, and then that you do come together on like what are the issues that you overlap on, and, mm -hmm. and considering that, and um, I think having more of that spirit of of uh, cooperation and being more intentional about that will help to effectuate more change. So I, I appreciate you sharing more about that. So let's talk a little bit about your book. Um, I had the opportunity sure, to sure. read it when it came out and I've shared it with others. Uh, what what inspired you to, to write the book? Well, you know, I, I've been giving lectures at colleges for a long time. Uh, FSU contacted me years ago and they said, we have this program called If I Were 25. And we had some problems with it. We, they, we, they were like, would you come and take over and lead it? And so I said, sure, but we got to change the name because I'm 24 years old. And so we named it to If I Were 21 and I'm 51 and I'm still leading it, right? So, so I've had this long background of coming and speaking to college students. And the longest time it was about, you know, careers in real estate and understanding what a cap rate is or talking about CCAM or ICSE or, you know, all these different kinds of things. And, and I still do a fair amount of that. But one time I got actually asked to lecture at the University of Florida and I was driving to University of Florida. I was thinking to myself, you know, so many times when I meet these kids, they're 20, 21 years old. They're exceptional. They're just really amazing, amazing kids. And then I started thinking about, let's talk about like, what does the future hold for them? What, what, what will these kids look like in, in 10 years? And I really started getting focused on the age group of 30 to 34. I think that's a very unique age group because mm -hmm. 
if you're 32 and you hate your career, uh, you can go back and get a graduate degree and switch careers and retire in a different career, which is, by the way, what my dad did. My dad didn't go to mm-hmm. seminary until he was in his 30s. You know, uh, this is sort of a negative thing, but sometimes people are married to somebody and they go, I don't want to raise kids with this person. They get divorced and marry somebody else and they, you know, they raise kids with somebody else, right? You know, at 51, I'm not switching careers. I'm doing my same thing. <laughs> and I've been married 26 years. I'm not switching, right? So, you know, at 51, you tend to be a little bit more in a certain direction. Uh, but in that 30, 34 out range, there's, there's, there can be transitions. So I, I had that in my mind. And then I start really thinking about what is it that I can tell these kids that they're not being told, right? Like if they're going through, you know, the master's program at UF or the undergrad program at FSU in real estate, you know, they're getting tons of knowledge, you know, like what do I need to, what do I need to teach them? So I wrote this lecture called the top five ways to get fired and the top five ways to keep from being fired. And I'm not talking about showing up late or not being dressed appropriately. I'm talking about like fired, fired things, like things that would absolutely end your career. And Amy, you've been around this business long enough that you, sadly you've seen it where, you know, you'll see somebody that's like in their mid thirties and they're just, you just think they're going to skyrocket and they do something so crazy stupid and they're out. I mean, we, we, you see that happen. So that's why I wrote the book or that's why, that's why I wrote the speech. Sorry, I wrote the speech. And then that became my most requested speech. And mm-hmm. so I'd have these real estate classes or our retailing classes at UF, for example, and they would ask me to come speak. And they said, we don't want to hear about shopping centers. We don't want to hear about real estate. We want to give that, that career speech. And so that speech became the book. Like uh, that's where I knew mm-hmm. I had something that was kind of hitting in a different spot. So I still rec- lecture about those other stuff, but the book was trying to dive into those issues. And since then I've you know, done a little bit more on, um, mental health and topics like that. So yeah. that's where I try to try to come in and be a good resource. One of my, and I, I think it was in this speech or it could have been another speech and, and I utilize it now, now that I'm more in a leadership position. You know, when I first met you, I was a solo and uh, now have built that, but you talk about um, the advice an acquaintance would give you versus like an, a friend. And, you know, often, right. you know, an acquaintance is going to tell you what you want to hear a friend is going to tell you what you need to hear. And so I've been able to utilize that in, in my, my own, you know, personal practice. And uh, yeah, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? I can't remember which example sure. it was. I think sure. you were talking about like an inappropriate relationship or something, if I'm trying to pull back yeah. on that. Well, what yeah. I talk, yeah. What, what I talk about is, is the way I explain is like an acquaintance. And this is just my definition. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but Acquaintance is somebody you just meet, you know, you just meet somebody yeah. and you're like, if I lecture some class and they can't say hello and they see me at Publix, like we're just acquaintance, you know, a friend would be like, you know, you and I are, are, are friends, you know, a friendly yeah. relationship that we're friends, know each other's established, things like that. You know, I start talking about, I, I've called brotherhood and sisterhood. And it's like that, like that intimate group. And what defines those people is the ability to say something very difficult and that you desire and want to receive it, you know. I think a lot of times in life, what we're looking for is intimacy. And that's whether it's in a personal relationship or in a business relationship to have intimacy takes healthy confrontation. Like if you ever meet a couple and they're like, we just never argue, we agree on everything. Well, at some Mm. point, one of you is lying. Like that's not even human. Yeah. Like it's not human for what would that even look like that we, oh, we both love Rocky road ice cream and we both love the matrix. I mean, like really, you know, like at some point you not have some level of anything that you disagree on right so you have to have the ability to develop a relationship where you're you're confrontational and in a healthy way and you deal with hard stuff so when i talk about in the speech it's like the, the kind of people that tell you like you've got food in your teeth or your zippers down or you know or i'll tell you this one i was at a conference recently and it was a friend of mine it happened to be a, a woman friend of mine we're buddies and I was getting some breath mints out of my backpack. And I said to her, I'm like, would you like a mint? And she's like, oh, is my breath bad? And I said, yes. <laughs> you know, yes, it is. You know, that's actually why I went for the breath mints. And she was in a position where she's going to be talking to a ton of people. And she's like, oh, my gosh, thank you. And so yeah. they were under breath mints, right? But, you know, you've got to feel comfortable with somebody to lean into that, right? And, um, you know, I've had a situation where a guy wanted to help out um black colleges and we were talking and he, he was really said he was really interested or had a passion for it but he kept mispronouncing famu and so i finally said to him like i'm sorry you're saying the word wrong it's pronounced fam you and like in my head i'm like 
if you can't say that word right, like you, one thing that tells me is you have no black friends, right, dude? Like you're not going to go around and keep mispronouncing this word. And I could tell the guy was really upset with me. And it's kind of like what we really haven't talked much since then. And so in my mind, I'm helping him, like I'm correcting him in a helpful way. But some people don't want that, right? They don't want the fig leaf knocked off. They don't want to be exposed, you know? So I think you got to decide what it is. And, and listen, as a leader, there are some people, leaders I know that really lead like, like an emperor. And, you know, hey, your job as an employee is to make me happy. And, you know, employees learn that. And they learn to say, you, they just say what makes you happy. They don't say the truth. And when that happens, the result is a very unhealthy company. That's a very unhealthy person, individual, and then creates a very unhealthy company. And a lot of then problems kind of, you know, come out of that, right? Hmm. You know, um, I was talking to somebody recently and I said, one of my observations is all of the households we all grew up in, the one you grew up in, the one I grew up in, they all had surplus and deficit, some level, right? There's no perfect child or whether they're all some surplus or deficit. The kid that grows, that grows up in a super poor neighborhood and doesn't have enough food to eat, they're very aware that they have deficit, right? They're yeah. aware, they're hungry, they, they know that. Sometimes a child that's raised in an environment that seems perfect, they have deficit, but they're not aware of it. And even if they are to start to express it, they get slapped for that because we have surplus, right? Well, mm -hmm. that child then becomes an adult and then there's a reaction to that that um, can become very unhealthy. And uh, a common thing whether it would be some sort of drug addiction, uh, can, that suicide, all kinds of things come out of that. You know, when we see, look, sometimes just, just Google celebrity suicide and it's like the saddest thing ever. You see all these people, all this stuff, and then they kill them. So how does that happen? Well, because underneath the veneer of the celebrity and success is a lot of unworked pain that's got to yep. get figured out. So the same is true is like in our companies, our companies have surplus and deficit. And so we want to have healthy companies. We learn to talk about what our company doesn't do well and express that. And then in some ways we address it. Some ways, you know, maybe if we're smaller and we can't fix everything, but we'll work, we'll work in progress. And we can say things like, man, like we're not good at this. And at least we can live in the truth of it, right? Last thing on all that, you know, I, I would always tell my daughters, you know, when we go through really hard stuff and we've been through some very hard stuff is the key to getting through hard stuff is to tell the truth about it. Now you don't tell everybody, but when you have a small group of friends that you, or a counselor that you can share everything with, it's telling the truth. Once you tell the truth, oh, it feels better. And then you can start dealing with the problem, right? Yeah. You got to face the facts. And I mean, just at, at some point too, if, if you don't, it, it will come to roost. It's, it's just a, it's just a matter of time. I, I've seen circumstances where, you know, somebody builds a whole foundation on that lie and it can all come crumbling down. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, and then too, talking about the organizations where they don't have that type of coachability or, or that type of relationship of like honesty. Uh, I, I think, you know, it, it, I think it's a, craved a lot more by millennials and those Gen Z and, you know, they, that there is a bit more authenticity. And so if that's lacking, it's, it's going to be challenging. Well, it's, it's the, uh, you know, the, the greatest generation, not, not to pick on them, yeah. <laughs> but you know, they, they had a reputation of coming home from work and have a couple of glasses of bourbon. Right. And then, yeah. you know, that baby boom, generation was you know going to Woodstock and you know doing all that kind of stuff and then you know, I don't know what you call them, whatever my generation what we're dealing with but this younger generation tends to be more aware of their their feeling and they tend to be more articulate and to be able to express it and so there are some things I think when I see college students today that I'm I'm very impressed with they're they're able to have conversations about race that previous generations were not they're able to talk about mental health and suicide and addiction. I spoke at Full Sail a couple of years ago, and um, I was scheduled to give a 45 minute speech, which I did. And I took Q&A for 45 minutes. And wow. I finally at one point said, I have to sit down now, guys. <laughs> you know, it's been an hour and a half, Lord. Um, uh, but again, the students, when I started touching on the topic of uh, addiction, they were able to jump in on that and really have a healthy conversation. So I'm very impressed with students. Now, the, you know, the flip side of that is sometimes, you know, they need to learn a little bit about discernment. You know, you know, I was telling my daughters like, um, 
you can tell me anything, but you don't have to tell me everything, right? So that could also be applied in the workplace sometimes. You know, there are right. boundaries, work, work, is, work is different, uh, but there is some, some help in all that. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, so you talk a lot about millennials, um, but we are starting to see more Gen Z in the workplace. Is there any particular advice you have for that those in that generation? Or maybe there's gonna be a sequel. <laughs> well, you know, look, I think that what I would tell uh, that generation is, is, is to pursue excellence and don't get defined by uh, a narrative that defines the entire group and the negative. And, and what I mean by that is this, like um, I was talking to Kasha one time and I said, don't job hop, do not job hop. Like, you know, get out there, take a job. And I would mentally commit five years and no matter what job you take, there's gonna be someone there that doesn't like you and you don't like them. And like, there is no part, I'll have grass, I'll have greener, like learn the skill set of having hard conversations and relationships. And, you know, there are times when you, you can realize like, wow, this is just what maybe tax is not the right word, but it's just not gonna work. And it's time for you to move and make an intentional move to a different direction. But, you know, I had a student told me, he was like, well, my professor told me the average student's gonna switch jobs every, you know, 18 months or whatever. And I said, well, that may be true. Are you average? Is your goal to be average? No. Is that what you want? <laughs> you know, because if you talk to professionals, you know, I've been in the real estate business now, gosh, I'm pushing 30 years. I've quit once. I've quit, I've quit once. And then I've sold a company. And then, you know, I think probably the rest of my life, it's going to be, you know, buying and selling stuff. Um, but yeah, I, 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 have, I have resigned one time. I've resigned one time in my life. And, and, and the reason why I say that, if you see people that are really successful, you and I said, hey, let's make a list. Let's sound like a list of the top 30 most you know, successful people you and I've seen in our careers, that one of the commonalities is they never got popped. I, I, I have no, I cannot point to anybody that you can say, man, that person was so successful and they job hopped a bunch. I mean, I, if you sit right now and I said, name, name, just name in your head the top five most money making brokers you know, I guarantee you, you're like, geez, yeah, in the last 20 years, they've been with two companies. Uh, that's pretty consistent. They, they are focused on making it work where they are. And if they do move, it is intentional. So, but that's just an example, but like, don't get overly defined by, you know, blank. You got to mm -hmm. keep carving your career. And, and the other thing I'll tell you is this, Amy, I'm going to say something really shocking to you. Here's something shocking. I, I'm very nice. I'm a nice person. Um, and I used to have people tell me like, you can't be a nice person to make it in business. I'm nice, you know, um, you can be like a conservative person. I don't drink at all. I don't play golf. Um, you know, you'd be successful. I like talking about race and I like talking about mental health. I've talked about my own mental health issues. I've struggled with clinical depression. I've been under the care of psychiatrists. I've been to counseling. I talk about that all the time. I talk about the right. fact I did my DNA tests and I'm part black, right? And so I've had multiple moments where I've had people say to me, you can't, you can't tell me that's going to ruin your career. It's going to ruin your career because you're talking about this or that or the other. No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Or people will say to me like, oh my gosh, like, you know, whatever top, some crazy topic. I, I, I can't tell you as long as I've been doing this, how many times people have told me, oh my gosh, you know, such and such is going to destroy retail and you're not going to have a job. I still going to have a job, right? <laughs> or how about this one? This is the most important election of your life. Every election, every election I've been through, every major <laughs> I've been through, I've heard that speech. And like, I'm just kind of like, dude, I, okay. So my point of saying all those things is, it's like, there are core things to being successful, like knowing your product, servicing your client, right? Uh, paying your bills, being a person of integrity. I was in an interview with, on a, on a Christian radio show and they were like, uh, what's the key to like, being a successful Christian business person, you know, put that ad mm -hmm. on there. And I said, uh, do everything with excellence and pay all your bills. Right? I mean, like, uh, I don't understand when I see some people who are really highlighted successful and then they're constantly not paying bills. Like that's, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, people ask me like, how do you get a reputation? Like, uh, I don't know, when you hire somebody, pay your bill. I'm just kind of crazy, but you know, you have to do those things. So there's no escaping that. You've got to be a healthy, productive person. You've got to do a good job, right? And then all these other things get added on top of that. 
there's so many things involved in that. But one thing that it makes me think of um, is I think if people are constantly switching things, looking for the next best thing, trying to, you know, advance things that they almost have like this constant whiplash. And, you know, you also think of some of the most, you know, successful athletes and they're not switching teams every year or two. They, they would never really integrate with that team and really see any progress. And so right. um, I, I do think that's really good advice because I think we've told people you can be whatever you want want to be and you you can set out to do that but there there's a path to that and there is a stick with itness that they need to need need to to do um well yeah and let me add to that amy like uh, you can't have it all if people are like you can have it all no you can't you <laughs> yes. can't date and have a healthy marriage right no you cannot have both those things right you know you can't be you know <laughs> Uh, a healthy person and eat whatever you want, right? Like, so you're not going to have it all. You have to look at your life and, and make some priorities and then you make sacrifices. I would say like, you know what, you know how you know what people love is what they sacrifice for, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody's like, well, I have no other plans tonight. Well, that's not, that's not that. When you, as a, as a parent, as you well know, when you're like, dude, I'm going to be up at three in the morning you know, helping out this child and you could have a mindset of like, I have to do it. Or you could say, I choose to do it. Like, this is my choice. You know, people, people drop their kids off at fire departments and leave their, they abandon their kids. People do that. Other people say, this is what I'm going to do. This is who I'm going to be. And at the end of the day, look, man, I've known some extremely wealthy people that were very happy. And I've known some very blue collar, hardworking people who are very happy. At the end of the day, it's like you can call the path and sacrifice for the things that really matter and don't sacrifice things for things that don't really matter. At, but let I me mean, say within that, making a choice to sacrifice. This is going to be hard and this is going to be painful and I'm going to do it. You know, you might say, John, what the heck are you doing with the work you're doing with black colleges? And I would say, well, it's really hard. It's a hard battle. It's a worthy battle. Right? It's hard and it's worthy. Why is a bridge named after my dad? Well, he stood up against the Ku Klux Klan. He stood up against them. He stood up against the mob, right? That's, you know, and, and he was a very peaceful in his later years because I think he did the right thing. He stood up and he had integrity and he kept, kept his commitments. Mm. And so understanding that, that there's a level of choice of feeling pain to achieve things that are worthwhile. And I think that escapes some people. Mm. I think it's, Amazing though, I that so many things that you talk about and you share about yourself can help others to 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 have more confidence, to share more fully of themselves. I mean, I've had points in my own personal life where I might feel not not wanting to share this or you know have this like persona. But I think the more that you do share, of course, with like discernment, of course, you become like more comfortable with that, and then you're able to make some meaningful you know, connections and, and, and not just have this uh, superficial relationship. And I think, you know, there could be some thinning of the herd of maybe those people that don't belong in your life and it can get drown out some of the noise that you don't, don't need. So. Well, I will say that after I went through the clinical depression issue, uh, I did a lot of recovery work to kind of like get to the root of what's going on there. And I speak in a recovery language of uh, now, mm that's been really helpful to me. And so I, I really enjoy having relationships with people who are former alcoholics and drug addicts and different kinds of issues because there's a reality to them and a wisdom mm. to them. Uh, the gal that cuts my hair is a former meth addict. And so every time I get my hair, I get my hair cut seldom, I let it go wrong and I get it shaved off. But every time I see her, I'm always say to her, like, how are you doing? And I get an update from her and you know, I really care about her. And she has great wisdom because she's a survivor. Like mm. most people don't survive that and she's gotten through it and she's still day by day, but I really appreciate that wisdom that comes, comes out of her. Right. You know, sometimes younger people mm. ask me about um, having mentors and I always tell them like, it doesn't have to be a formal relationship. Most of the best ones are not formal relationships. Sometimes your mentor doesn't even need to know that they're your mentor. You can have multiple mentors. You can have someone that mentors you as a father and as a husband and as a caregiver, and then some that mentors you as far as business. And, you know, sometimes people who are maybe hard to work with, um, but they still can offer wisdom and, and insight in a certain area. 
And so hopefully what we have is a lot of arrows in our quiver of, of resources to help us in different, different ways. Hmm. I like the, the in the recovery language though for depression or, or anything that you're, you're um, dealing with. Uh, I, I have OCD and so I have, they actually have a 12, 12 step program for that. And it's something that I think because you can get um, the ruminating thoughts and you can't get your mind off of it. It can be very helpful for me in business, but then it can also be very devastating because I get fixated on something and then can't get past it. And so then learning how to get past it and stay in that. And I think there should just be much more discussion about these mental health issues. And so that, you know, we can well, move forward and have these, you know, these good conversations. You know, Amy, um, uh, I went through a season of my life with different friends who had children, uh, teenagers uh, who were having serious drug issues, and they would spend $100,000 and send them to Arizona or something, and then they'd come back. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But one of the things that bothered me about that is like, how many people have that kind of money to do that? So, mm. you know, we as a society need to provide more, um, you know, free resources. And that's one of the beautiful things about AA and, and some more programs like that. They're free. They're all our community. There's a group called Halos that helps out if you've um, lost someone to suicide. Mm. And so, you know, what do you do? What do you do if you've lost some suicide? Well, Halos meets two times a month and it's free. You know, you go, I go, anyone with your sister they could go to it. And, and then they could go and just tell their story and say, hey, I lost my friend to suicide and just cry and, or be angry and like just get that out. And so learning that that, that exists out there is a key thing. You know, Amy, look, I, I believe in, in work. I think work is important. And I believe that whatever we do, we should do it with excellence and really try to be the best that we can be. I, I, I completely believe and have a passion about that. And then I also believe that um, having a real roundedness, healthiness to us, you know, I think what's funny to me is I, at some point, you know, I grew up not having a lot. And when I started in the business, I had nothing. I think I furnished my first family room for like $15 and I'm not exaggerating, like, like always use furniture and just, you know, I used to use clothes that was wearing used suits that I had hemmed in when it came to work. I had, I started in this business, I owned four white shirts and I would just iron them every day and rotate them, right? So I know what it's like to like have scarcity and not have stuff and really be thinking, gosh, do I pay this bill or that bill? So once you get past that and you have a like capacity, well, then what are we going to do with that capacity? You know, what are, what are we going to do and what kind of impact do we want to make? And there's no guarantee about how long we're going to live. And so we get our arms around like, hey, let's work mm -hmm. hard. Let's pay our bills. And then let's try and find a ways, whatever our gifting, and our passion is to come back and serve communities. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff that we can do. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you could talk to your younger self, so you talked about getting into the career, into your career and, and whatnot, but even before that, is there any advice you would have given your younger self? You know, it's, it's a funny thing, Amy, because, you know, sometimes we can think about um, regrets and things like that. And, and it, in one sense, it's hard to have regret because, you know, life teaches us, you know, mm -hmm. one of the jokes I used to make, and I still say it's true. It's like, I'm embarrassed about what I learned in my forties. Like in my forties, learned about stuff. I'm like, gosh, I'm old. I should have known about this earlier, but sometimes it's like, we learn things when, when we're ready, you know, yeah. and uh, you have to experience life and experience on a, on a journey. Like for someone who has never had a child to try to explain that to them or prepare them to it, you can read every book in the world until you like have the child. And then you have that experience of that or owning your own company and, and, and those kinds of issues. I think when I try to think about that question, what, what comes to my mind is, is one is I would probably coach myself on trying to be um, calmer, more consistent. <laughs> I used to go through seasons of like not exercising at all and super exercising and not exercising <laughs> at all. Like probably just like, just like, Hey John, just for a couple miles, just like being more consistent. And then I think um, um, there's this balance of, believing in oneself and then open to coachability, right? Mm -hmm. So I've done well when I've really taken in good coaching and, and really mm -hmm. seeking that out. The other thing I would tell you, Amy, is I am an outlier. I, I don't fit in traditional patterns. And I didn't learn to my 40s that I'm dyslexic. And so, you know, there was somebody in my life a few years ago, and they didn't like how I'm out there all the time. They're like, 
you're out there too much, John. You're doing, you're cross when you're out there, you're doing all this, you're out there too much. Hmm. Yeah, but try to reflect on that and like, gosh, well, this is, and I finally come to conclusion, I probably just shouldn't be friends with them. Like, you know, like, I mean, yes, I need to be, you know, my one friend says to me, John, it's important that you're bold and don't be dangerous. And so certainly as I get older, I want to be discerning and not take unnecessary risk or, you know, not being too provocative or something like that. At the same time, I need to be who God's called me to be. I need to be yeah. this person. And I've made the conclusion that I'd rather make less money and give more away. And I'd rather spend some of my time doing issues that are really important to me. It's, it's who I am. So it's this balance of um, absolutely taking in constructive criticism and seeking it out. It's just, you got to get that from people who are really trying to help you. Sometimes people are trying to coach you and, and they're not helping their motivation. They're dealing with their own junk or they're trying to promote themselves, right? Um, or you know, people that really do believe in you. But at the end of the day, it's really trying to stay focused on what that core who you are as a human, mm -hmm. you know, there was a guy one time, this is a true story, guy one time, he was a mechanic and um, guy brought his car in and the mechanic was good working on his car. And the guy whose car was being worked on said the mechanic, he said, Hey, have you ever played basketball? And the guy said, no. And he goes, well, I think you should try to play basketball. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think he was a guy was a coach at a junior college or something. Well, the guy, the mechanic was seven foot four and his name was Mark Eaton. And then he had a long career in the NBA and was really successful. I mean, can you imagine a guy being seven foot four and he was a mechanic and this somebody finally said, <laughs> you're tall. <laughs> you, know, you may want to do this, you know. So uh, I think I feel very fortunate in my life that in some areas I'm tiny, tiny. I'm short, short, short. I'm not qualified. But other areas where I have a gifting and I'm so thankful that I've been allowed to like launch into that. Um, but there's some aspects of that I had earned. You know, I had to like gain trust and respect, but I also had to spend money well so I can pay my bills, you know. So, but I'm that that's a really good feeling in life to be able to like mm -hmm. ascend and feel like, man, this is purposeful. I will say one last other thing to you, Amy. I just want to hear you say this that um, as I've gotten older and now being in my 50s, uh, you know, in a lot of places, I don't want to be the man anymore. I, I'd really rather be um, a cheerleader to Amy, you know, like. And um, things that used to be like, oh man, it'd be cool to be the, like the head of that board. And I'm like, no, I really want to see um, I'm be the head of that board, or I'm, yeah. I don't want to be the head of that board, or you know, whatever. And um, I've seen some men who are in the generation above me that stay around too long, right? They lose their relevance, and I'm kind of embarrassed for them, or they're staying in positions, and other people get the positions because they're locked into them. Mm. So I really hope I hope that God gives me life in. I hope that I'm able to enjoy the season and I hope that season includes a lot of cheering. That's what I hope for that. I, I'd like to be, you know, just on the front row or the balcony either way. And I'm really helping to see other people get lifted up. That, that's a fun thing. I, I agree. I think creating pathways for, for others to experience prosperity through through their leadership journey or otherwise. Um, and that was a lot of the work that I did locally within CCIM is I felt that there wasn't this rotation cycle. And so redoing the organization so that we were bringing it forth. And um, we actually will have another female, uh, Hispanic female president coming up of CCIM Central District. And you really just didn't see that lineage. And so, it, or that that uh, succession planning and being more successful on it. And so, you know, maybe not always it's money, but, you know, putting forth your time and like helping yeah. to effectuate change and putting the right people in place that have like a shared vision of creating something different to create. Um, I think it's a completely different organization. I think we met probably 2014, 2015, um, than it was even then. And, and now I see that it's continuing to, to evolve and, uh, what, whatnot. So is there I, anything uh, else? I, uh, Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I mean, you know, it's a cool thing is it's a cool thing to see somebody that you helped to live on the way, get some big promotion. It's a cool thing, um, to hear somebody give a speech and they're quoting you and they don't even know they're quoting you. Right. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a cool thing. An example of something cool, like uh, the students at the FSU real estate conference today are like it. And they're just so great. And they're so encouraged. And people are like lobbying to be working with students. 
Uh, but in the beginning, it wasn't that way. And um, mm -hmm. people did not want the students. They didn't care. When, uh, when we launched ICSE's Next Generation campaign, which was to promote young people like yourself into leadership, there was a group of people that fought us on it, openly fought us. They did not mm -hmm. want young people with this. And um, so, you know, um, there's, there's certain battles that uh, they're, they're, they're won. They're won. And uh, sometimes people don't have that perspective and that, that's totally okay. But I have the perspective of, you know, I joined the business when I was 22. The second youngest person I knew was in their 30s. I didn't, I didn't have any contemporary. I didn't meet people. I was like, oh. And so now to see young people and seeing uh, marginalized, what were formerly marginalized people making decisions. And it's, it's an exciting time. So we live in a much better day today uh, than we used to be, you know? Yeah. We can't take it for granted, though, either. I think just continually being intentional about that and and helping to to keep those organizations going in the right direction, and, and it, it takes continual work. I uh, recently watched uh, the Netflix film um, All Quiet on the Western Front, and mm -hmm. uh, don't watch that if you are of a of a faint heart. It's a, it's a very sad. It's a remake, and I remember watching the original one. But when you've got all these young lives uh, that were lost in that war, kind of pointless, right? It gives you a perspective of like mm. the gift of life and then thinking to ourselves, what are we going to do with this life? And, and so the, the last thing I'll with is this, Amy, that, you know, there was a recent TED talk about how people who live healthier, they don't smoke and you know, eat healthy and all that kind of stuff. But here's the surprising part. Um, they have relationships, like, and we pour in from but they have relationships like talk about like close brothers and sisters, kind of, you know, not literally, but people in their life. And they also have lots and lots of connectivity. They have, they, they mm. are first names basis with the cashier at the 7-Eleven they go to or, or Pollux or their buddies with their dentist, right? Like they might see their hygienist, you know, twice a year, but when they do, my, my name is Leslie. I'm like, Hey, Leslie, we always hug each other and stuff like that. Right. And that that makes for a longer life for both people. So I think that uh, trying to encourage people at every level to have a, um, some kind of humanity and mm. uh, trying to make that connection, you know, in our lives every day, um, it's, it's good for us and it's good for people to interact. So trying to make that connectivity, I think is very cool. I think taking yourself out of, you may have these things that you're trying to accomplish yourself. But trying to think of the whole and, and making these connections, you just don't know where that's going to lead you. That's been actually a discussion at my church for like the last several weeks. And so I've been actually much more intentional about that because I can fall into as giving as I am, I can start to get into the me, 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 and then I forget about the other things. And But it can be as simple as saying hello to the cashier or 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 the person that's waiting on you or parking your car or whatever it is, um, but making those co connections, not just when you think someone is going to be con convenient for you or in, in a transactional sense. I, I would agree with you on that. Well, I wanna, I'll want i finish with one, one story. Yeah. Um, so I go to the same convenience store multiple times a week and I, I see the same ladies in there. Uh, but a lot of times I'll go in there on the weekend, I see a different lady in there. Usually one during the week, I'm wearing a tie, but on the weekends, I'm in gym shorts. So the gal is here on the weekend and we have a nice little banter back and forth. And we are we are demographically very different. We're, we're probably kind of close in age, but um, uh, she's Hispanic. I think pro probably a different sexual orientation. Don't know, sure, just, you know, whatever. Um, and no judgment, just whatever. Uh, she has a lot of tattoos. I don't have any tattoos. I know you're surprised to hear that. Um, but we're just seem very different. But we have a nice back and forth. We have a friendly banter. If you will. So it was Mother's Day and I was coming in there and there was no one else in the store. Maybe there was somebody, but they were in the back or something like shopper. And I was trying to think of something funny to say because I was trying to say something. And I just said, I'm like, oh, it's Mother's Day. I got to text my daughter to make sure they take care of their mom. And she looked up and she looked at me and she said, um, my child died 20 years ago. And I said, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm so sorry. And she said, well, you know, she never liked me. She never liked me. Um, we just didn't go along. She just didn't mm -hmm. like me. And I said, well, I am so sorry. I'm like, have you worked that through? Have you kind of dealt with that? And she's like, oh, I'm good. I know I'm good now. I'm good now. And so I said, oh, well, I'm, you know, that's, I'm, thank you for sharing that with me. And then I just said, I, I just, just hugs to you. I just kind of put my hand up. Amy, 
she shot across the counter, grabbed me, held me close, and she rubbed my back. Okay. So that, that humanity, right? Like that moment, like that, that was the most important thing I did all day, right? And I don't know her name. She doesn't know my name, right? Mm-hmm. But that connectivity of, of um, she unveiled her heart to me. And then I really tried to unveil my heart to her. And we had that, had that human, human connection. And I think that if we could try to be more aware of that stuff, you know, the other stuff could kind of melt down a little bit, a little bit better. Mm-hmm. But she blessed me. She blessed me. That, that, that is much more of a story about her giving to me. I'll never forget her hand on my back, just rubbing my back and just being like, mm-hmm. gosh, this is just a very real moment. And I'm very grateful for it. So more of that would be probably good. Yeah, we'll we'll end on that. So what is the best way for anyone to connect with you? Well, I don't like people, so don't connect with me. Ah! No, anybody anybody can connect with me. Um, uh, I'm tapped out on connections on LinkedIn, so you can't connect, but you can follow me. You're welcome to do that. You follow me, you can message me. Uh, You certainly can visit my website, which is Crossman CB, which stands for careerbuilders.com. And you can message me through there on through social media. And, um, you know, look, I've got a podcast out there and I've got a YouTube channel. So I'm a very accessible, reachable person. If somebody wants to reach me, you certainly could do that. And, and I, I'm trying, I'm trying to put things out there that help. So like, if you go to my website, I have a guide to real estate that's free. It's out there. The YouTube videos, a lot of my lectures, let me talk about, they're out there. The podcast I have, not the radio show, out there. And then my book is very inexpensive. And if somebody really wanted me to write a book and they couldn't afford it, just email me, I'll make a copy. You know, make that yeah. simple. So I'm trying to be a person that's like, like pushing stuff out there and, and uh, hopefully hopefully that's helpful. That's what we're trying to do. Hey, I, th- I think that's awesome. We need, we need more of that. So... Well, thank you again for joining today. And for those listening, be sure to like, uh, like, subscribe, share, download all the different things to uh, keep others uh, seeing this and to share these great uh, sessions. So that's it for now until the next episode.